Coming up, we catch up with the man who's worked with all the greats. I was with Nicky Lauda two years, um, Elaine Prost for two years, and Ayrton Senna for six years. We go shopping with the Arrows hospitality team. And keeping drivers' bodies and minds in peak condition, the Arrows team fitness advisor reveals all. Reading a driver's state of mind is, is, uh, is a very acquired art, really. It's a marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Arrows arrived in Belgium after a tough weekend in Hungary, a hiccup after steady progress in previous races. The cars, fast on the straight, did not adapt well to the twisting Hungarian track. But both cars did finish, showing that reliability is improving. It was as bad as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it, it brought out all the things that we know are bad in this car, really. And uh, we didn't have a very good weekend. We knew it was going to be bad before we got there, and it was. And it was just something we had to go through to get to the better tracks. And hopefully this is one of them. Going into Belgium, Arrows lie in eighth place in the Constructors' Championship with four points. In the Drivers' Championship, Pedro and Jos are 13th equal with two points each. The Belgian Grand Prix has been held at spa francorchamps since 1950. It's a fast circuit with an average lap speed of about 225 kilometers per hour. But with some difficult corners, it can be dangerous. Drivers enjoy going there. Very challenging for them, some, some fantastic corners. Eau Rouge, I think, is probably the corner in Formula One. It's the one everybody talks about. It's the one everybody wants to go flat through. Got a very long straight, so there is the chance to overtake if you get a good run out of a rouge. I think you're flat from La Source to the chicane at the end of the straight for 23, 24 seconds. A quick way through the bus stop is over the chicanes. So it's very much a balancing act between soft for the bus stop, stiff for the high-speed corners. The bus stop is the last corner before the starting grid. From here, drivers break hard for the La Source hairpin and run downhill to the Eau Rouge, which is taken at 290 kilometers per hour. The circuit's longer straight is taken at 320 kilometers per hour. Drivers change down to second for Le Combe and hit Malmedy at 180. It's then down to Bruxelles, a right-hand hairpin. After that, into Pu Ong in fourth, drivers leave the double left-hander in fifth at 240 kilometers per hour. After Fania, there's a sharp left-hander, then two right-handers taken in third, then fourth. Then it's flat out all the way through Blanchimont to the bus stop. High expectations this year. It's a circuit that we expect to go well at. The spa francorchamps circuit takes its name from the local town of Spa, famous for its baths and mineral water drunk all over Europe. It's in the Ardennes forest, a region of Belgium popular with walkers, but this weekend, it's more popular with drivers. Formula One drivers. It's Friday, practice day at the Belgian Grand Prix, and Arrows are hoping for points this weekend. I like Spa, but, and hopefully it should suit this car. We think it will, and, uh, you know, it's, it's as close to a home race as Jos ever gets, because Holland's only a few miles away. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a good race for us, hopefully. But while Arrows may feel their car is well suited to it, Spa is in fact one of the most challenging circuits in the championship. The most dangerous corner is Eau Rouge, taken flat out by only the bravest. I would say Eau Rouge is the ultimate uh, challenge for a driver, yes. The car hit, hit the ground very hard every lap and uh, it's just to find a way that you're uh, that you're not touch the ground as hard and, and still go uh, fast through the other corners. To get the most from the circuit's long, fast straights, the cars are set up with small rear wings, producing less downforce and optimum speed. Yes, just one time lap this time, please. Just one time lap. Start it on the green, please, Crunch. The cars hit the track, the drivers eager to prove themselves on the fast circuit. Um, stop 
much in it, Chris. Uh, I would say maybe less turn in and more more oversteer on the exit. On Yossi's next run, his electrics develop a glitch. And suddenly all, all the information on the steering wheel was gone. Couldn't change down, um, couldn't pull the, the clutch, and then suddenly it went into empty stall. And then I could go down to the gear, but then the throttle wasn't working. He just has to leave it to the mechanics. Both drivers have lost the chance to do vital practice laps, so less time has been spent optimizing them for qualifying on Saturday. Uh, hold for it, hold for you. Just up on front wing, when today really, black zero. It's disappointing really, because we were, we came here really optimistic. Uh, we thought that we were going to be much higher up really. The car is too slow really, in the slow corners. Just, we have to improve that area and uh, we know and we are trying to fix it. Just, we don't have enough track time so we'll have to take our risks to change the car because like this is too slow. A week before the start of the Belgian Grand Prix, the Arrows trucks set off from Britain. Ten hours and 620 kilometers later, they arrive in Spa and the hospitality crews start preparing the site for the rest of the F1 team. At a Grand Prix, everyone's expected to get their hands dirty. These hard labourers are in fact some of the team's chefs. It's not just the kitchen area that's their responsibility. They must ensure that the whole hospitality area is constructed before the rest of the team arrive. For Wayne Raphael, who came from one of London's top restaurants, Formula One was a big culture shock. After the first race in Imla, I was, I was ready to leave. I was ready to leave. I was like, what is, what is going on here? Me coming from a, a, a hotel and restaurant background and coming into the Formula One paddock and having to do all this, uh, these other jobs. Not me, well, not what I'm used to. I'm used to phoning up, ordering stuff, getting it all delivered to me, having people to order about. And then I come into the Formula One paddock and I'm pretty much down at the bottom now. Whereas back in London, working in a restaurant, I was near the top. Do you want to... One of Wayne's jobs is shopping for food. He's found a small grocer's shop a few miles from the circuit at Spa, home of the Belgian Grand Prix. Wayne's given advice on which shops to visit by hospitality manager Chris Lees, who's been making these food runs all over the world for 16 years. You do build up some sort of repartee in different countries. Each place you go, people remember you. It's almost like these are your friends around the world, you know. And that's nice, actually. It's quite nice, isn't it? Uh, kumquat. Uh, orange. Orange. Petite. Well, I'm not really... I really haven't got anything planned. I'm just seeing what I've got that's good um, to buy it, so then maybe I can plan a menu. I'm just seeing basically what he's got, and then I'll go back and then I'll plan a menu. Things that he has got that are good that I will buy. Donc, ça, tout petit. Yeah. Today is only, what, 30 people for lunch, then tomorrow the whole team comes, so that'll be about 50, 60 people for lunch and probably 50 people for dinner. Then on Friday, guests start coming, so still obviously all the team for breakfast and lunch and then probably about 30 guests on top of that, so we aim for between 80 to 100 people, something like that. The whole team has to be fed throughout the week, from the truckers and mechanics to sponsors, guests and drivers. If anything, the drivers are some of the easiest people to look after. You know that when, when the drivers come to a racetrack after a Thursday, he's not going to eat any heavy foods anymore. He's going to eat pasta most of the time. Sometimes the hardest people to look after can be the mechanics. I'll have some peas and sweet corn, but can you pick out the sweet corn? I don't like curry. So, oh, I like the curry, but I don't like the rice. You know, can I have something else? But you can't keep everyone happy. But they have to at least try. So, in need of more produce, Wayne and Steve check out the local supermarket. The race among the teams for the best food is just as competitive as the Grand Prix itself. We've got the new rear wing actually on here now. We're actually developing this. Um, this is the rip cord if we actually do go too fast around corners. Uh, but you can see we're actually going for 
a complete no stop in the race. We've got our fuel load actually on board, so we're going to go completely, hopefully do, do the shop in, in an hour flat without any uh, pit stops. Salbo, Williams and Prost are all here too, stripping the shelves clean of food. You can see the teams here. It's a race against time to get all the drinks. but not warmed up the tyres at the moment, so I'm having a little bit of traction problems, especially with the other customers as well. <laughs> Three trolleys full, two more to go. The more room? Yeah. Good well, luck, mate. You got to fit all this in, mate. We'll do it, Crikey. Got eight foot. Yeah. One hour shopping, two hours putting all the stuff in the van. Exactly. Nice. Everything in the van. Wayne and Steve head back to the circuit. <laughs> at the circuit, it's qualifying day at the Belgium Grand Prix. And while some relax, Josh Verstappen's mind is concentrated on the car. Yesterday we had an electrical problem, and uh, this morning as well, we, we did only two runs. And then we wanted to go out again, and we had a, another electrical problem. And uh, it's not good to have them. And especially for this circuit, uh, I think it's by far not enough. But Jos and Pedro are going to have to push themselves and the car to the limit if they're to get good grid positions. It's going to be ugly, let's get it over with. Jos races off for the start of the busy session, but there's still changes to be made. We have to have a look to the tyre pressures because uh, the other set definitely had, had more equipment in the front than those do. I had quite a lot of embers there now. You're not pushing too hard, are you? Because you were quicker on the first section on your in-lap again. No. The mechanics are working in the car at the limits of engineering technology, and pushing this hard means things can and do go wrong. And when they do, Jos just has to be patient. Do you think that run was better or worse than the previous run? I think it was worse. Jos finishes the day 20th. It's an awkward moment for his race engineer, Chris. Any better? Doesn't make any difference. We had a problem with the diff. Just we got too, so, too much. Some, yeah, but yeah. We have some. No, the diff is locking too much under brake. We ran out of tried to get another map in it for the last run, but ran out of time. Whatever I do, Chris, please. Yeah. I turn the wheel. Yeah, no, no. I, no. I believe you. Swap. I don't think uh, we were ever going to be in the top ten. Um, obviously, Pedro was 16th, and. You know, that's always the benchmark you measure yourself by, I guess. Um, the, the person you compete with most is your teammate. Qualifying has been frustrating for Pedro, too. I'm not extremely happy about how they did go, because on the last two la uh, runs, I was always three, four, ten quicker. Well, one, I made a mistake, the other, there were yellow flags and uh, Alessi spinning in the last corner, so I, I couldn't finish my lap. We have a lot of work to do, really. Pedro's car is in good hands with Dave Crabtree, a mechanic who has worked with many of the greats in Formula One. I'm the number one mechanic on Pedro de la Rosa's race car. Um, that job involves liaising um, with the engineer um, on the car and the two number two mechanics on the car. I started at Lotus. I stayed there for a further two years 
uh, and went to McLaren. I was with Nicky Lauda for two years, um, Alain Prost for two years, and Ayrton Senna for six years. He was a genius in a racing car, there is absolutely no doubt of that whatsoever. Um, he could make a racing car do things that other people could only dream of. As a person, um, he was difficult to get to know, but when you got to know him, he was a very, very nice bloke. I was thinking of taking a break because I'd been in it so long. It all happened the weekend that Ayrton got killed, and I actually handed my notice in at McLaren the day after and took four years out and I swore to God at the time that I'd never come back and do it again but time certainly heals a little bit. I don't get on too well with people outside motor racing. There isn't the same commitment or the skill. I've got to be honest that when I was at McLaren I could never understand why people wanted to work at the other end of the pit lane because they were never going to get the results. If you don't get the results, you don't get the prize money. What is the point of doing it? We do the same amount of work at our end of the pit lane as happens at the other end of the pit lane. There's no difference there whatsoever. The commitment with the people that work on the cars is exactly the same. At the moment, just to, just to get two cars to finish the race is an achievement. And if they're in the points, that's great. Um, you can't really ask for more than that at the moment. In recent years, the fitness of Formula One drivers has become as scientific as the design of the car, and most teams now employ fitness specialists. I think the, the input of physios has been fairly limited in, in Formula One to date, and it's a sport that we're learning uh, a lot about in a very short space of time, really, uh, uh, as to how useful a physio can be. So, to a degree, I think you have an a open rule book and you make your own job, really. Pedro and Simon regularly have two hour training sessions, which can involve 40 minute cycling interspersed with reaction drills and strength training. <laughs> I would say there's there's three kind of drivers, the ones that train a program, personal trainer or someone that keeps an eye on them and they are willing to do it. <clears throat> then there's the drivers that train without a program but train a lot, just playing football or playing tennis or whatever, which I, I don't really think is a good way. And then there's the other third type of driver that don't, don't do anything at all. And there, there is, I think. So this is what, what I think nowadays more and more drivers and the team especially have pushed the drivers to train more so there's very very few that don't train at all a formula one driver has to train aerobically and anaerobically this combines the fitness of a marathon runner with a sprinter training for a formula one driver doesn't stop as soon as one race is over he starts working towards the next normally i what i do is i train monday tuesday and wednesday uh, with, with what, some aerobic and some, some small parts of fine aerobic training just to, to wake up like an engine. You need low reps, but sometimes you need also high reps, so it's just the heart rate, a lot of stretching. And, and normally on Wednesday, before a Grand Prix, I do some reaction training just to see how awake I am, my mind is. Give you one to five. Simon Jones has devised special exercises to simulate the physical and mental demands a driver faces during a race. Three, spin round, catch with any hand. Four, just touch the right cone, any hand. Five, touch the left cone, any hand. As well as the physical strength needed to control a car around challenging circuits for two hours, the driver needs to cope with the mental demands of driving, gear changing, braking, accelerating the weather and track changes. No two laps are ever the same. Just an amazing amount of information that goes through these guys' heads and that's what makes them extremely special. Two. One. So I work them at a very high pulse rate in excess of 180 beats a minute to replicate what, the, what his pulse rate would be in the car at, One. say, the latter stage of the race when they're tired. And then it's just imposing mental demands on them. So they're having to think all the time and they're having to think quite laterally. So you're just chucking in different orders. The whole point of that exercise, it might be very simple, it looks simple, but it's, it's how is your reaction going to be like when you're tired driving a car? Three. So when you start to get tired, 
your reaction times are slower. Five. Because there's less oxygen coming to your head. So what you try to do there is forget about you, how tired you are and still your reaction to be intact. Okay. One more set through. You have to get your suffering outside the, the room, you know, just close the door and that's okay. And then when, so that it doesn't affect your driving. That's the whole point of it, basically. Every sporting professional needs optimum levels of fitness, but unlike other sports, a lapse of concentration in Formula One can be a matter of life and death. In any other sport, if you're not fit, you make mistakes like in ours, but it means you, in football, you lose a ball or you, you I don't know, it is, you're not achieving your, your, your marks, but in our sport, it means you can have an accident. The amount of training involved in reaching peak performance levels means that a driver physio relationship has to be strong. <laughs> Reading a driver's state of mind is, is, uh, is a very acquired art, really. And you've got to try and support them as best you can. If they haven't had the best of races, then we, 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 we sit and try and analyze it. And I like to, I, I end up a bit more of a sounding board for them. Four. If you don't get on with him, you don't train well and you just end up not wanting to see him. And then if you don't, that happens, it just, you don't get to train too with him. So it's important. It's a marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Race day at the Belgian Grand Prix, and mist hangs low over the Spa circuit. It could be good news for Arrows, as their A21 car performs well in wet conditions. Never a dull moment at Spa on race day. That's yeah, what we need, though, isn't it? Race like this, you might get a point. It's dry, you won't. <laughs> the heavens oblige, and the track is soaked. <laughs> it's still soaked by the time the cars are on the grid, so the race has to start behind the safety car. Just a couple of laps will allow 22 highly efficient sets of Formula One wet compound tyres to clear massive amounts of water from the surface, making it safer to race on. The safety car peels off and the race is on. On lap seven, Jos runs into the Benetton of Giancarlo Fisichella, whose engine has cut out. Fortunately, he keeps going after nudging the Benetton out of the way. Last year, Villeneuve and Zonta came off at Eau Rouge. This year, all the drivers survive. After a gruelling hour and a half, the two hours finish in 15th and 16th a sign of increasing reliability. Five other cars don't make it home. We thought the car would be competitive here. Uh, the car wasn't very competitive. We had a few problems in practice. Uh, we lost a lot of running due to reliability problems uh, and paid the price, really. Didn't have a very good setup in the race. Um, I guess the one good thing to come out of it is we got two cars home again, um, which is uh, two races in a row now. So. That's a nice improvement. If we keep going like that, at least when the car is competitive, we can get it to the finish and uh, maybe pick up some more points. It seems to be the story of the year. You know, when we're reliable, we're not quick. When we're quick, we're not reliable. If we can get those two things to coincide and start understanding the car a bit more, um, then I'm sure we can get some more points. Next time, gearing up for the American Grand Prix. How do you get an F1 team and three cars across the Atlantic? And race team secretary Nicky John takes control. There's some very important documents in here. You must not lose this itinerary. 